We are um, going to be speaking about um, digitization and how it enables growth. Uh, I'm honored to have uh, Dr. Long with me uh, here today as well. We have uh, cities that are intelligent communities from all around the world waiting to speak for a couple of minutes about one thing that they've done to enable, um, to use the digital infrastructure to enable um, growth in their communities. And um, what I'd like to do first is to go to Finland. We've got Espo Finland waiting to speak. Uh, Nico Ferm is with us. Hello, Nico. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. And now I know you have um, very little time today, so I really appreciate you making the time to speak with us here in Vietnam. Um, and so I'm going to ask you the question very, very quickly so that you can um, answer. Can you please discuss uh, with us the way that the digital platform, the digital infrastructure in ESPO has helped to improve the quality of service that you provide to your citizens? Because you talk about the city as a service itself. So please tell us briefly about that. Okay, thank you. I actually have a couple slides to show also. So let's see if I can share them here. Okay, so to, to go to the subject shortly. Uh, so hello again, everyone there. My name is Nico. I'm, I'm uh, working as a strategy manager here in Espo and, uh, and uh, I would, would like to start about the strategy <laughs> uh, just shortly that it, uh, in ESPO, our strategy is called ESPO story, and, and the idea is that it's telling where we are coming from, where we are now, and where we are going. And actually, this city as a service model uh, that I'm presenting now shortly is, is the way that we would like to implement our strategy. Uh, so what it, what it means then, uh, well, in previous uh, show you uh, or presentation, you actually heard about triple helix, or then you have probably heard about open innovation models and these kind of things. And this, this actually is our way of thinking uh, about those uh, methods and models of cooperation. So the basic idea is to transform the traditional thinking of producing services on the perspective of uh, administration on the perspective of people-centered uh, services. So we put the uh, people first and then, then we call our partners and people who are in, in the ecosystem. So, so the larger companies, the scale-ups, the public sector, research institutes, and so on, to create these services for, for the people. So not just that the city organization is creating services, but we create them together with the other, other companies and, and, and so on. And of course, we are trying very uh, carefully take into account the different domains of sustainability. Uh, we think that the city's role is to accelerate these ecosystems. So more and more, we should uh, try to find the solutions from from the from the companies on, and other uh, other players in the field. Uh, I would say that quite many probably you, you will hear same kind of presentation, same kind of ideas from the other cities also. So this is something that like all of the cities currently are uh, involved. And, and we have just a, maybe a different approaches uh, with the different cities. But I also have one example here. Um, so, so this is one of the projects that we've been doing with, the, with some of the bigger companies in, in Finland and research institutes. Uh, and, and the project is called Luxtarim 5G. If someone knows Latin, then you probably have some idea what it's related about. It's related to smart poles. Uh, and uh, I know that there is all over the world, we have currently different kind of smart pole projects going on and different kind of uh, projects. But the thing that is probably quite unique in this one is uh, uh, that it's not based on the, uh, the current 5G that everyone is uh, uh, implementing all over the world, but it's based on the uh, 26 gigahertz frequency. Probably this doesn't tell many of you that much, but what does it mean to have that kind of, but basically it means that you have fiber-like connectivity uh, available uh, through 5G. So this, for example, will enable this kind of autonomous services and so on. But 
actually what I'm more interested about and what is related to this city as a service thinking that we are trying to build here in Espoo is, is that the, uh, we are creating the service level. So first we create this infrastructure of uh, connectivity. Then we have the data market there and data uh, systems. But on top of that, we need to create this kind of uh, service layer. And, uh, and most of you probably know that the Apple store came and, and with iPhone, they broke the market and, and like new services and new, new kind of application were coming uh, all the time. So the idea is a bit same, but in a city scale. So you create this kind of a network in the city with the connectivity and with the service layer so that everyone, uh, developers and so on, can create new services on the top of the connectivity. Just so we understand here, I mean, what you've done is you've put the technology underneath that you just described, the 5G or the 26 uh, megahertz, and the data layer underneath it. And what you've really done is to create an Apple phone-like structure, but for the whole city. Is that exactly is that that's pretty much yes? So that's what we are trying to do. For yes, the city, for the entire city. Very good. And and what has been one of the significant outcomes of that for the citizens that you're most proud of? Um. Well, well, actually, my favorite probably is that uh, uh, that we are, we can do this in cooperation with the. Uh, with the security and the fire department and so on. So, so we have had this kind of a test also that when we have a, a situation, for example, a fire going on, then we, with this service, there can be autonomous drone sent to the, to the site and they can actually deliver information for the police and the fire department about the situation. So these are something, it's not yet in, like in, in, uh, in use, but this is something that we, we have been piloting. Very good. So uh, again, this would be very effective for public safety. Exactly, yes. This would be a tool for that. Great. Um, I was talking earlier about you have 520,000 people and you have made 37 million contacts with your citizens last year. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary in terms of service that you provide. Um, so we, we were all impressed by that. Well, listen, you- I'm um, impressed also. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yes, and, and you did it. So congratulations on that. Um, Espo, by the way, was an intelligent community of the year, and I think you can see why. Um, Nico, I know you have to leave, but I really appreciate you coming to us live from Finland. And um, we hope to talk with you again soon. Yes, thank you. It was nice to be here. Ciao, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So we're gonna stay in Europe. But we're going to go to another intelligent community of the year. Dr. Long, you remember them. This is Tallinn, Estonia. Yes. We have uh, Mr. Martin Maniel, the CIO, who I think you know. Um, and we wanted to ask uh, Martin, Mr. Maniel, about cybersecurity and how Tallinn has used its transformation to an ICT-based economy to produce a very high level of uh, security for its unique citizen identification program. So, so Martin, welcome to Vietnam. It's great to see you. And Hello. Um, yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? We can hear you fine. So I, we wanted to ask you, um, Estonia is known as one of the most, the most connected city um, in the world. You know, the most sophisticated in many ways, the most secure. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, how, how, it's, how you're working with the digital platform to keep the city secure as you work on these other programs for citizen use and identification, please? Thank you. I also have a couple of slides. So Tallinn is the capital of Estonia, counting about two thirds of the population, uh, about half of the, of the GDP, about 800 years old city, etc. Uh, and uh, and today I'm going to concentrate on on, on our e-services and uh, security behind it, and, uh, and especially on uh, on our digital identity. I was very impressed by our neighbors uh, from Espo 
we have a similar uh, stack, uh, but uh, we don't label it, uh, it, as a, it as a service, but it's it's impressive approach. I, I really like it. Um, so uh, about the services in city of Tallinn, we have been uh, winning regularly different awards, also Intelligent Community of the Year 2020. Uh, and mostly these are because of our mature uh, digital society uh, level of e-services um, and, and the public sector's uh, contribution is mo mostly e-services, public e-services. And we are not just building them, but they are heavily used. Basically, you can uh, apply for every service in Estonia and in the city of Tallinn in uh, uh, via electronic channels. And mostly these are just not the front end, but uh, behind it is a, is a workflow system where the service is also, also managed. And uh, in many services, uh, more than 98% of the services are, are applied via electronic channels. And even, even elderly people in services provided by cemeteries, etc., more than two thirds are, are using uh, electronic channels. And this is uh, and now I arrive to the topic of trust. And it's all, uh, all uh, achieved uh, because the e services are, are considered trusted. On the center of this trust are, is our. Uh, our ID card based uh, e-identity and uh, digital signature uh, infrastructure. But it's not just a electronic, uh, it's, it's not just an ID card and, uh, and technical solutions behind it, but it's also a legal framework, uh, ability to track the data, how, how government is using your citizen's data, uh, etc. Uh, all these layers are, are, are very well covered. We have been building them for, for 20 years. The general sentiment is, is towards electronic solutions is, is very, very positive because the government, government agents, agencies, uh, different foreign auditors have, uh, have always promoted our solutions. They are considered safe, they are considered trusted. So, so I don't even recommend that you should all have a similar ID card based e-identity that there, there could be several different uh, technical solutions, but the main aim is to create the necessary trust and it's mostly a legal political challenge, not a technical challenge. Martin, can I can I ask you a question? You you said you've been working on this for for twenty years. Um, you've been building this these layers. You've been building this level of sophistication into your system, um, and you people trust it because because why? Because it is protected. Because they've never had an incident, or because it works so so easily. Why why is it so trusted in uh, in Tallinn? I think it's probably down to our history. Uh, we started building uh, e-solutions on 25 years ago. Uh, we considered it something like our thing, which we are good at. All the political parties were behind it. The legal groundwork, uh, legal framework was very strong. We can actually see how, it, how our data is used. We, we can track our data. If some government agency have, has accessed my data, I can ask why you used it for, and they must have an answer. And, and if they don't have an answer, some certain procedures follow. So, so the main thing is trust. And of course, it's easy to use. It's, uh, it's calculated that the average Estonian is, uh, is saving five working days in a year because of the electronic solutions we have. And uh, we have basically two things that our, uh, we can do our, with our ID card. One is access to, to uh, authentication, to access to any information system available. Is it private sector banks or, or e-voting systems or, 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 or just regular e-services? 
And the other thing is, is digital signature, which, is, uh, which means that every document we create, we can store them, them in electronic format, which allows us to buy, uh, to build, uh, to build uh, workflow systems where you don't have to export the document and store it in, in, in paper format. Uh, the whole life, life cycle of the document can be in electronic format. So, so that, that's convenient to use, that's uh, cost effective. So, so the trust combined with, uh, with uh, ease of use is, is probably the, the, the key. I think you're right. And, and a citizen can do everything on that, that one platform. So it's for the citizen, it's the most convenient way to manage their, their banking and their, all of their information, right? That's a, that's a very convenient service for the citizens. Yes, and one thing I would like to emphasize, we're nowadays talking a lot of a lot about uh, acquiring services for from private partners or or uh, having this uh, this startup like uh, very rapid development cycles uh, where we build, fail, rebuild, test rebuild, etc. I think uh, some of the cornerstones of this, this digital society should be built differently. Uh, when we are building up uh, this e-identity system, we, we should take very conservative approach. We should have the, the, the legal framework in place. We should test the technical solutions. We should have every possible trusted organization uh, testing it. Uh, and so, 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 so there, there should be no failures, and we don't, we have not had major failures, and, uh, and th that's very important. Yeah, and and so you you go very carefully um, with this. You you make sure you have the legal uh, structure in place, the the political support, all of the necessary elements uh, in in the community are are agreeing, and everybody knows the levels of transparency. So. You're saying that that is probably the most significant aspect to continue to build on this system for the benefit of the citizens. Is, do I hear that from you? Yes, exactly. And the next layers uh, on top of it, these can be built by, by everyone. It's just a cornerstone that you have to have. Very good. And, and they're very adaptable, the layers, right? Because there's no legacy. Uh, software or anything to deal with? Is, is that one of the other benefits? This is also another benefit. But anyway, you have to have uh, this domain-driven design, very component-based architecture. So every system becomes legacy one day. You have to be able to replace it. Exactly, yeah. Well, Martin, uh, I really appreciate you making the time for us. And it's always great to see you and to, to speak with you. We've done it a few times in the last few weeks. So uh, again, thank you very much for joining us here at the Top 7 Announcement Conference. And, uh, thank you, thank you. Take good care of yourself. So that Thanks. was Martin Manil in Tallinn, Estonia. He's the CIO there. Um, we're gonna go now to a, um, a city that was not a um, intelligent community of the year, like Espo and Tallinn, but has been a top seven city. Uh, so they also have performed at a very high level. And we're gonna uh, end up now in Australia where Chris Carver is going to join us from the Sunshine Coast and talk a little bit about uh, how they have digitized their platforms and how it is impacting investments and other things. Chris, it's great to see you, welcome. Thank you Lou, great to be here this evening with you, with you guys. Well, as I said, we, we really want to understand how the digital platform that you have in Sunshine Coast does more than uh, obviously facilitate that big tourism industry that you have, uh, that it does uh, other things that lead to something that we're very interested in here in uh, Bindong, which is attracting investment and supporting economic growth. Can you speak uh, to us here about that, please? Yeah, I certainly can. I've, I've also got a few slides to hopefully uh, do that. Okay, we can see your slide now, Chris. I, I don't, yes, I don't see a surfboard there, but that's okay. 
<laughs> I can turn that. I could turn my screen around and give you a pretty big, pretty good view of that. We are very fortunate to live um, uh, in a in a community that has been seen as a tourism community in the in the past. And I think there's a couple of key things that we'll take you through um, tonight. That's kind of changed that for me. I've I've lived here for over 36 years of my life and really seen it transform from infrastructure through to an ecosystem of support through to enabling industry 4.0 um, businesses and the talent pathways that we need to support the growth of um, our community. So I'll take you take you through a little bit of that and, and also um, been a proud member of the Int Intelligent Community Forum over a number of years and um, enjoy learning from many of these very successful other uh, communities. So, and thank you Bindong for um, hosting us this evening as well. So from a, from a, um, a starting point, I suppose we have grown from that tourism place and as you can see beautiful, beautiful beaches and all that sort of thing, but we needed to start with an infrastructure base. Um, and that infrastructure base was really about putting in key uh, infrastructure, such as an international broadband cable that connects us directly to the rest of the world via Guam, um, as well as making sure that we were connected both from um, international airport, from transit, and making sure that we were an accessible city so that it was a, a community that people wanted to, wanted to grow and wanted to flourish in. I think one of the, the biggest things for us was really the investment into some of that game-changing infrastructure and linking that through data centers, making sure we had the right cybersecurity and innovation nodes, but also, and as importantly, was making sure that the industry such as healthcare, education, finance, clean tech, et cetera, were enabled. And that's some of the stuff I'll, I'll explore briefly right at the end is really around those key industry 4.0 uh, businesses that are enabling the growth of our community and offering uh, the next level and taking us from tourism to, a, to an intelligent community. I think one of the things that, um, we're, that I'm most proud of, um, particularly with our work within the Sunshine Coast Tech Industry Alliance is working at all levels um, to provide talent pathways for our youth and those that are wanting to change the way that they look at technology and see it as an enabler. And I think for, for us being able to have our university, to have our um, TAFE and our high schools all working together to focus in and go, okay, what do we need to be industry relevant? How do we change the way that we are focusing our course design and building talent pathways that go all the way from doing robotics in high school to being able to come out of um, come out of high school into tape into into a university and be able to have that pathway designed all the way to being able to get jobs and I think one of the things that may have been missing in the past without this was we didn't have these in these key industry sectors ready to go and so it's been a combination of that infrastructure complete ecosystem of support around there from all layers of government and community, um, as well as building these key industries. So you can see um, here within our ecosystem of support, we've got um, support at all layers from startups, scale-ups, uh, we just talked about um, education, uh, but also from being able to have innovation centers, really having platforms for people to come connect, learn, grow, and build more together. And I think that's a really successful piece and probably a part of our DNA that has supported us as a community over, uh, over the last hundred years, we kind of grew up as, a, as many communities then linking together. And now that's, that's been a key factor within our um, tech and how we're growing and being able to innovate as a community now. And the last one um, that I really wanted to talk to, and this is a really key one for me because it's not just about us being able to um, put in this key infrastructure and have these ecosystems of support, but we needed to have organisations that were competitive both on the national and international scale to support our community and provide the, the, un, the underlying employment for these. And so we've had some incredible success um, across food and agribusiness, 
bringing those together and there's a new project called Turbine um, and Barnes Lane Farm with some collaborations that are leading edge in the tech space from, a, from VR and AR all the way through to advanced manufacturing, um, as well as I think where you visited Helimods and a few of these others and there's um, a couple of others, Grease Boss and a few of these others that are really doing some amazing things in the advanced manufacturing world that are providing our um, young people and people coming out in the community jobs that are internationally competitive, uh, as well as our fintech industry with both Budget Direct, UE, Open Insure, and really getting a solid base of some real disruptors in the market that are now growing into incredible employers employing, you know, 15, 2,000 people plus here on the Sunshine Coast. Um, these industries are really for me, the change that's allowed us to be able to link all of the other things together. And um, for me, one of the things I'm proud as a, as a local community member. Thank you, Chris. Um, so just, to, just to summarize, or maybe to simplify uh, for the audience here, it sounds very, it sounds very similar to what uh, Bindong is trying, has been doing with their industrial parks. And um, which is to try to put all of the elements together so that, you know, you just don't have just manufacturing going on and the workers come from someplace else and they don't live there and they're not part of the community and there's no innovation going on and there's no students being taught to fill the jobs. They're thinking like you guys in that you have to have everything in place in order for this to work. Was, was, that, the, was that the most significant part for you to be thinking through the educational system, the workforce system, the innovation system to, to have all of that thought about and working together before you could really perform uh, and grow at a high level? I think it did. I think um, back in 2012, there was some real foresight um, from the community and the local government here on the Sunshine Coast to um, be be part of and there was key members that we all came together and wrote what was called the regional economic development strategy or the red strategy at the time and that really talked about these key things that we needed to build over the next 10 to 20 years so that um, we could we could become this intelligent community and be able to build and grow together and I think you know it felt like a little bit of pie in the sky when we wrote it but now that we look back less than 10 years 10 years ago and see so much of it come to fruition and so much of that um is is so exciting and i think the vision of that has really created that so i really implore um, bin dong and others that are trying to do it it doesn't take as long as you might think and i as long as there's a clear vision and a clear path to it um go for it so i think that's very good advice dream, uh, dream big, and expect to spend maybe 10 years, but maybe less if there are better examples to study from like yours. That's, that's hopefully we can all learn together and be quicker. Well, that's the, that's the idea. Uh, Chris, thanks for coming on. It was great to see you and uh, we hope to see you again, or better yet, we hope to be in Sunshine Coast for an event someday. We'd love to host you. All right. Again, thanks for making the time for us. Thank you. So that was uh, Sunshine Coast Australia, and you heard a little bit about uh, how they put their innovation system together, uh, having a very, very strong digital infrastructure. Uh, so that was, that was key to that. From there, uh, we're gonna go to uh, one of my other favorite places in the world. We're gonna go to France, Dr. Long. You know a little bit about that. Um, I see Eric Legal, who is the Director General of EC Media, from a multi-time top seven community, Ici Les Molino in France. Eric, welcome. Bonjour. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I, I will share my, my screen first, and um, after that, my uh, vision about uh, um, the smart city uh, in Ici. So maybe some words about uh, Ici Les Molino, because I'm sure a lot of people uh, in this uh, place don't know where we are and who we are. So um, you see, it's uh, one of the cities of the greater Paris, so in France, um, but we are also one of the most innovative one um, in this, in this uh, area, because we start our digital transition, our strategy uh, 
25 years ago now, and I'm working with the mayor um, since this time because uh, uh, in my city, uh, we have this uh, specificity to have a, a long period uh, with the same team because the mayor uh, Santini is mayor uh, since uh, more than 40 years. And uh, I'm uh, working with him uh, since uh, 30 years. So of course, it's a special situation in Europe and in uh, all in the most cities, I suppose, in, in the world, but also in France. But it means for us, it's very important because this stability um, is a key of uh, our development because uh, Isili Murino was an industrial city uh, in the 17th and we are very hit by the industrial uh, crisis at that time. So we have to restart um, totally the way uh, we have to manage the city. And we chose with the mayor to um, to create in a very innovative uh, situation and uh, digital cities. So 20, 25 years ago, we start this strategy. And this time, we, um, we were very often the first French cities uh, to uh, create new services or new uh, infrastructure for the citizens from, of course, uh, the website for the government, but in all the way uh, in the municipal fields, for example, um, we were one of the very few French city to uh, e vote with the machine uh, in every election. Maybe we, we you know that uh, we have just a general election in France uh, this spring, and uh, we have only 50 cities in France to use the, the electronic machine to vote. But we are also the first uh, to create, for example, to um, introduce the pay by phone for the, the parking or to other administrative uh, procedure or a lot of different things uh, in different fields for the smart grid in energy, for the driveless uh, cars, uh, for the mobility, and uh, a lot of different things you can see uh, in this screen. Uh, and for us, it's very important because the smart city is not only about uh, technology. It's a very uh, what we can do with technology to create new services and to improve the quality of life of our citizens. So we have a um, very user-centric, citizen-centric vision about the smart city uh, in EC. And for us, the most important thing is, of course, how to use it uh, for the citizens. And um, for example, so, sorry. Did, did you want to say something else? Because I, I have a question. I, I'm dying to ask you. Yes, you, you, you can ask the question, yes. Yes? Okay. Yes. You know, I, I, we were talking a lot today about the importance of creativity uh, in the economy and, and how uh, creativity produces a good economic output. Uh, you, have, you are one of the first cities that I can think that I know of in the world that focused on the creative economy as part of a, an overall strategy. Can, can you help us understand what that actually means and how a digital infrastructure supports and, and enables that? Uh, it's our methods. Um, our, our vision is very simple. Um, we, we want to be the first in France to introduce new technology, new infrastructure, to attract uh, more um, business, more companies. And it's working because uh, in my city today, we, we have more jobs as inhabitants and we have a lot of um, uh, international company in the digital field. For example, we have the headquarter of uh, Microsoft France, of Cisco, uh, Capgemini, Orange, um, and so on, but also of other international company like uh, Coca-Cola France or um, Yves Rocher, and a lot of uh, media center also with uh, the first uh, uh, European pay channel, for example, Canal Plus, and really a lot of companies, a lot of jobs. And our vision, our objective was to help our citizens to find job in a good industry and for helping them by this innovation and to be the first. So it's really um, a methodology uh, we create, I think, so, a lot of years now. And um, for example, now we are, for us, the digital transition is over because we 
did all we are able to do uh, for the citizen and the city and the attractivity of, of the city. So we decided to improve our this methodology, this vision to help the city to adapt to the climate change, for example. Um, we, the municipality adopted last year the first uh, CO2 budget in France. And for that, we need, of course, a lot of data because uh, uh, we have to create indicators to assess and measure the greenhouse gas reduction in the city. And this data strategy is uh, one of the uh, most, um, I, I don't know what, what the time, the most uh, ambitious uh, vision we have in France because uh, it's very difficult to find these data, to identify what kind of data we need and to, to collect them, to analyze them and to share them with the population to explain to them uh, how, um, how it's working and what we are doing. So for Very example, good. this climate budget, well, you can see it's of course to respect the, the Paris Agreement, but it's, for us, it's also very important because we, we give sense to the smart city because you, you know the smart city uh, is very often viewed uh, for the population from the point of view of the citizens like a, a, a tech uh, things, sometimes with a lot of um, uh, scaring things because uh, we have a lot of sensors and things like that. And we, we are very proud to give sense to this uh, smart city to explain people it's for them and it's uh, very improved. You, you, I have to add, we are today one of the French cities where the local taxes are the very low because of this um, success story and we have no debt. So I, as I said, we have more jobs than inhabitants. So we are the very uh, concrete uh, proof that uh, to, to be, to adopt this uh, digital strategy was a very efficient for the city and for our citizens. The ability to communicate that with the citizens allows them to be more participating in managing the, the climate, you know, from their own behavior. Is that correct? Uh, of course, the most important thing is to uh, to improve the ability of the citizens to be with our, our strategy. So we have to communicate a lot with them, to associate them to uh, our idea, and to and to sensibilize them also to uh, these um, priorities. And uh, as I said, because we we were very often one of the front first front cities to adopt new services and new. Uh, Technologies, for example, we were one of the most, one of the first to, to have 5G or fiber to the home everywhere in the city. Um, it, it's helping a lot of, of people, yeah. uh, of population to, uh, to be uh, modern and to, to find jobs on, uh, in, the, in the city. Yeah, you've really been pioneers there, you and of course, Mayor Santini. Uh, I didn't realize you've been there for 30 years. You look so young, but uh, maybe it's because you, you love your work. Of course, uh, yes, because it's, uh, it's moving, it's moving. It's uh, always new to think, to do. <laughs> always new. Eric Legal, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's good to see you again. I haven't seen you in a while. So thank you for sharing that information. Thank you very much. I hope to see you next time I'm in France. That was Ici Le Molino, and um, we're going to go from, from France, which in, in a community that was really one of the pioneers in a lot of areas of the intelligent community many years ago, and you met one of the, one of the most inspiring people, to someone who's a, a recently an intelligent community, but intelligent community of the year in 2015. Um, the gentleman's name is Moez Chabani. Moez was the deputy CIO in Columbus, Ohio, when they were named Intelligent Community of the Year in 2015. You recall that. Um, Moez um, is an expert uh, in this field, but I also am proud to say that he is the chairman of the ICF jury, which um, if Bindong becomes a top seven city, he becomes a very important person because he manages uh, our jury of, of 50 people from around the world who evaluate your data. But today we don't wanna to talk about that, Moez. We wanna talk about 
some of the work that you've done in the healthcare cluster in Columbus, Ohio. So Moez, welcome to Vietnam. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Good to see you, Lou. Uh, good to see our esteemed panelists and everybody. And thank you for uh, Bin Dong and, and the entire committee for hosting us. Uh, we truly appreciate you and, uh, and we appreciate all the effort and all the great projects that Bin Dong has been doing and to uplift uh, its citizens and, and uh, its, uh, its audience and, and constituents in general. Uh, very appreciative. Moez, what, what we really uh, wanted to talk with you about today, because we've been talking about this uh, offline here as well, is how after Columbus digitized its infrastructure and telecommunications networks, which you were a very important part of, you began, it began then to help support a sophisticated regional healthcare economic cluster and, and a workforce, which, which both grew the economy and also grew that industry. And just for the audience here, Columbus, Ohio has a very strong uh, series of hospitals, universities that uh, re do research in healthcare. And what they did, Moez, I will turn it over to you, was to use those the institutions as the base for building a wider part of the healthcare economy. So, Moes, can you just expand on that for us, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Lou. Uh, and I'm sharing a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, a little history here. So, Lou, you, you and I talk quite a bit about the soul of, of the infrastructure and what, you know, when, as we engage these smart city programs and smart in, intelligent community programs in general, we ask, you know, what it is that we're trying to accomplish? How is this going to lift uh, our community? How is this going to affect our citizenry? And, you know, in Columbus, we have a long history of that. Uh, you know, I think a little bit of history also provides a little context, as you probably know. Um, you know, Columbus and Central Ohio has been central to the ARPANET project. Uh, you know, the ARPANET, for, for those who don't know the acronym, stands for Advanced Research Project Agency Network, which is the, uh, the birth of the internet itself. Um, then, you know, and that happened in the 60s and 70s. So the idea was to connect all research institutions uh, and defense agencies throughout the United States with a wide area network. Um, and Case Western University up in Cleveland, Ohio State University in Central Ohio and Columbus, and a few others were part of that. Uh, which is the idea of taking supercomputers and connect them so you can do proper research and, and, and advanced research. Uh, in, in, in healthcare uh, and uh, mathematics and science, all that. Uh, that went on through the 80s. And then in the 80s, you know, the start of the privatization of the internet and, uh, and by 1990, you know, uh, it, it, it kicked wide open. But at the same time, there was still need for a strong focus on academics and research and healthcare and financial services. So uh, then the birth of the, what we call the ORANET, you know, the Ohio Academic Resource Network. So that was the backbone right in the middle of our own backyard in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, and that connected uh, supercomputer centers throughout the nation to Columbus, Ohio. Um, fast forward again, you know, to the early 2000s. And now we have Oranet fully developed, uh, ultra fast, 100 gigabit network. Uh, you know, it. You know, and they experimented with all kinds of stuff. They experimented with copper, aerial, buried. They experimented with microwave. They experimented with satellite, and finally, you know, came the fiber optic world. Right. Once we got connected uh, to the rest of the world through an ultra fast 100 gigabit network, you know, with fiber. Uh, that was kind of the kickoff uh, to a race of, uh, to a digital infrastructure. Um, when we took over in the administration in Columbus, Ohio, we recognized um, that we have a valuable asset in our own backyard. That is the Oranet uh, that connects us to the rest of the world. And we went on building a proper infrastructure for the city on a fiber network digital infrastructure that allows us direct connectivity to that ultra fast 100 gigabit network and establishing service hubs throughout the city. 
some in downtown, some in, on the fringe, but every service hub kind of focuses on, on their industry. So there is an academic hub, there is a, a healthcare hub, there is a financial services hub, there is uh, research and development for all kinds of things. Uh, you know, uh, like uh, recently for COVID, you know, uh, one of the early sanitizing equipment came from Battelle, who is in the back you know, in the backyard of, of Ohio State University. So, so these, these were service hubs that needed to get some serious digital infrastructure, both from a connectivity as well as from computing power. Fast forward again, you know, to modern day uh, and the healthcare sector itself uh, relies heavily on digitization. And I'm gonna pick one example here. Um, we have uh, in the right outside the downtown area uh, on literally just like up two blocks from downtown. Um, uh, we have a strong uh, children hospital network. It's, it's a campus. It's an entire campus. It's um, comparable to, to the Mayo Clinic in Cleveland, comp comparable to many, you know, big, famous, uh, you know, uh, cent centralized healthcare providers, but this is for children's. It's the, it's the Columbus Nationwide Children's Hospital. And they do quite a bit of research and they do quite a bit of treatment and they have people coming in from all over the world. Um, children's Hospital had a need to do something very important and, and, and very simple in, in, in its concept. Um, so they have a great oncology department uh, that treats cancer in children. Uh, the problem with treating cancer for children is uh, throughout the world, there's about 100 to 120 drugs that can treat cancer. Um, but for any given child, depending on what cancer they have, uh, there's probably no more than half a dozen, like five or six drugs that are effective. And to match the appropriate drug to the child to the, to, for the right treatment, is a process, uh, and I'm not a doctor here, so I'm gonna try to simplify the process. Basically, they take the genome of the, the child, so map the genome, uh, and then uh, map the, uh, the cancer cells, and then match the two together, send them to a supercomputer, um, and try to find which drugs are most effective, which cocktail of drugs is gonna be the most effective treatment. That process, because they had to first you know, do the genome, uh, of, the, of the child, get the full DNA. Um, you have to process it on a supercomputer, then bring it back, then match it up to drugs, send it out to all the drug agencies out there, uh, all the manufacturers and figure out which one works. That process approximately took anywhere from four to 21 days. And imagine, you know, a child is waiting for, for their treatment. Because of the backbone, because we were able to take the infrastructure of Columbus and create a direct connectivity to that Children's Hospital campus. We took that process down to 20 minutes. So hang on a second, Lois. So you went from 21 days to find out which treatment a child with cancer could get down to 20 minutes using the digital right. from 21 days to 20 minutes. Wow, that's, I'm sorry, but go ahead. That's, that's, a, that's I mean, an enormous it, leap forward. It is an enormous leap. And it requires a lot of data being moved. It requires supercomputers working, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a very distributed environment to come up with a, a, a recommendation. And, and, and that's a feat in itself. Again, the soul of, of this, what are we trying to do with all this? You know, it's, it's, it's to save lives, it's to lift up uh, people's lives. And that is at the heart of it. So, it, and it doesn't stop there. That was a very one simple example of, of the impact of, of, of this technology, you know, this powerful technology that's in our hands. Um, you know, we, when, when this campus kept growing, there was a need for additional workforce and workforce development and bringing the workforce to the campus. So uh, fiber to the home became very important. So instead of doctors living in a suburb, having to drive an hour to get to, to the hospital, there was an urban development project going on simultaneously as this children's hospital kept growing. So uh, there was investment into the area uh, to urbanize it and to modernize it and, and make it a thriving community connected to the world. And now doctors and nurses and staff for the hospital live within a walkable uh, distance 
to the hospital. That meant, first of all, they don't have to go too far to treat. That meant an e a thriving ecosystem where uh, the providers and the residents and the, um, the patients are commingling because, uh, you know, with the add-on of uh, the Ronald McDonald House right there and, you know, outside the campus meant families, doctors, uh, nurses, practitioners, all of them are living and thriving in the same community, you know, and they don't have to get on a bus or a train or, or a car to get there. They can walk and mingle among each other. It's a thriving ecosystem because of the connectivity and the fact that that whole area has been revitalized and, and, uh, and developed. Yeah. And that's, a, that's, that's, thank you. That's such a, a wonderful story. And what has happened is you, you knew the technology was there. You knew that you had access to the supercomputers. Uh, you knew you had the doctors and the nurses and the researchers living in the area. So what you really needed to do was to bring them closer to their work, to their right. research, to their hospitals, to their treatment centers, to create this, this effect now where human beings in Ohio are getting much better health care, uh, children's cancer is being identified and treated earlier, and research has been continuously stimulated by the fact that more researchers now come in because of all the good work being done there. And the digital infrastructure was, was at the base of that. You, you were able to use your innovation and identify it and build a strategy on it. Is, do I, is that a... Correct. That is correct. You know, it, you know, it, it, it's really that ability to leverage and being able to connect the dots. Uh, we knew we had a great asset with Oranet. We knew we have we have to build a great infrastructure for the city. But then it's going that one last extra mile and making sure that the services, uh, you know, we didn't just leave it dangling out there we picked exactly where we needed to go so we can have the highest impact. Um, and, you know, I guess, you know, uh, opportunity is, uh, is, is, is where uh, luck and preparedness, you know, come together or, or something like that, right? Or, or, uh, and, 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 and for us, it was very important to be prepared and take advantage of, the, of that great uh, asset that we had uh, in our own backyard. Yeah, and, and, and again, it, it was great political leadership on the part of the mayor, great technical Correct. leadership on the part of your team there in the CIO's office, and great strategic thinking. So, Moaz, thank you for, for coming and sharing that with us this, this thank morning. Thank you, Lou. Time. Martin, Pleasure uh, to be here. Colleen's <laughs> clapping for you. So, very good. Um, Gentlemen, we're going to bring it back to Bindong now, because this is where the action is in the world. Uh, I've got my friend, Dr. Viet Long, with me. Uh, he's the director of the Department of Science and Technology here. And uh, you guys all know him, I think. And you, you know your colleagues here. Um, I'm going to ask you um, to have a conversation. And if you want to comment on what they've said, that's fine. But I want to ask you because you've been working so closely with the Triple Helix, um, how has digitization uh, here helped make the Triple Helix, uh, uh, the concept of the Triple Helix a reality? First of all, I'm very happy to see all of our friends and uh, partner in uh, ICF uh, now online, but uh, we haven't met like two years ago, right? Before COVID, right? So uh, to be clear, I would like to reconfirm the concept of a triple helix. Uh, it is a cooperation between the government and uh, enterprises and academy, uh, university, schools with uh, people. But, but for, for Minyong province, we also enhance the importance of giving the people as the base of the triple helix. So it's very similar with the ideas of uh, EC or uh, Expo we have, a, we have a seen here. So with uh, experience in Ming Yung, I would like to answer your question in two directions, uh, go and back. Uh, digitization helps 
implementation of triple helix, uh, but triple helix also support digitization. It's a very important in uh, our experience, what we already see. First, uh, we all know that uh, the two key of uh, implementing triple helix uh, are the connecting, the connection, and the sharing. So it's very clear, we all know digitization evidently enhance the uh, connectivities like uh, Expo and uh, I think uh, Columbus, uh, yeah, uh, emphasize on that many times. And you know that uh, the connection through digitization uh, can be, uh, you know, we can reduce the geographically obstacle uh, of uh, contacting people like what we are doing today. And we can see also uh, this very clearly during the COVID-19 time, right? Um, even uh, in ICF, you make, uh, I think, three or four uh, conference online, right? So the second thing is digitization in force. Uh, the sharing is a key condition to make the triple helix work. And in fact, uh, thanks to the digital technology, we can gathering and sharing information better, right? And uh, we get a nice experience with Mingyum province uh, with a smart city operation center, um, like uh, the example of uh, EC, uh, digitiz uh, digitization helps the government to obtain and analyze better the information, the data from the society uh, much quicker update and also uh, sometime uh, on time. And for sure that is uh, support uh, the government to manage better the society. And co on contrarily, the digitization also help uh, to uh, publish uh, transparently information and share it with uh, people, with citizens, with uh, businesses. And it's a very important condition to make the real triple helix model. Uh, uh, but uh, we can also see a problem here uh, if the digitization already bring to our community the connection, the good connection, the sharing, do we need the triple helix anymore? Yeah. Um, but there is another important element of triple helix I didn't mention with you uh, um, before, that is, is the trust. In the triple helix, we need the trust, we need the model, the way, uh, party communicate and work together and is it the part of uh, the most important part in triple helix therefore the triple helix is still essential uh, even in digital digitization and the digitization help the triple helix uh, but not replace it yeah it's uh, our point of view and i think uh, Tallinn also give us many uh, examples quite similar with what i want to mention here uh, moreover, uh, I would like to expand my sharing a little bit more. Uh, is this clear that in the 4.0 era, digitization become uh, inevitable? It's very clear. But uh, digitization, we, until today, is a new uh, field and is still a huge challenge of uh, many cities and, and countries. And we cannot apply uh, the classical method to uh, make a digitization uh, fluently. So before maybe in some tech, some kind of technology or project, the government, government can work alone or sometimes they work with enterprises now. But in the situation of, digit, uh, of digitization here is uh, more complicated. And it's a moment where the triple helix can uh, show the uh, advantage uh, to, to help us to make it uh, stronger. And you know, the digitization, uh, for example, need the effort of the whole community. So where you can find the important role of the government or digitization can require a huge investment, uh, the new business model, et cetera. So where you need uh, the participation of business and uh, digitization also needs need, uh, to uh, constantly uh, researched, uh, surveyed, analyzed uh, the data, et cetera, improved technology, et cetera. So Columbus uh, mentioned this many times, you see, and also uh, we need urgently the digital citizen 
the label fox, to master the digital technology, and also the training programs to support the community to uh, to uh, after, uh, to adapt with the change of the world with technology. So uh, I think Vietnam we have uh, a idiom cái khó lo cái khôn. So I can uh, explain in uh, English something like difficulties uh, make us uh, sager. What like more make us sage, 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 sager. Wiser? Uh, yeah, wiser. Wiser. Yeah, kind of like that. What is it? What's the word? Uh, because when you have a difficulty, you have to find a solution to do it. Yeah. You know, and to 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 solve it. And this moment, you you really uh, you know think more, and sometimes you can make a real innovation from that. Right. So our situation here with digitization. Uh, it's very close with the idea how we bring triple helix and make it more you know innovative yes yeah uh and finally um lou and also people here share many time and uh, you have um, uh, a discussion about the smart city is more than just technology right and the most popular mistake of uh, building a smart city you also mentioned in the press conference uh two days ago is uh, people assume that the digital technology can solve uh, anything, uh, every problem, right? And it's not true because I strongly be believe uh, with uh, your point of view. I think technology is constantly improving and innovating. And uh, if we only buy or apply it, we always be obsolete, right? And uh, Tallinn and Isi also, confirm it many times. And I really like the ideas of uh, EC or of uh, Sunshine Coast, where you play the games with uh, digitization, with uh, industry 4.0 to attract uh, investment and make your community stronger, more innovative, and also uh, richer. You know? so it's a very, very nice uh, approach. Uh, we, I think that we totally share with this point of view with the new province here. And uh, so the most important factor of smart city and, uh, and social economic development in a 4.0 era, uh, as uh, Lou already mentioned also, is a human creativity or innovation. So in being we think uh, the same. We play the smart city like a strategical plan, master plan to uh, to make our society better, uh, richer, more sustainable in uh, environment, in society, but also in economy, and uh, and uh, we define a smart city like a vibrant, well connected, and innovative uh, ecosystem, and uh, in which all the parts are constantly being improved, optimized or innovated. So is this a real smart city, you know, or very close with your, your approach of intelligent community? So uh, in current context, I think it's clear that uh, digitization is a great tool and also triple helix is a key of innovation and it is the foundation of development. Uh, and I think that is the reason why uh, it's very nice that uh, ICF took a great choice to uh, today uh, with the subject of digital innovation, uh, drive growth in our community for the post pandemic. Yeah. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. I have so many questions for you, but we're, we're out of time I, I, about the future of the triple helix. But uh, I think I heard you say that the triple helix will continue even though digitization gets stronger because there's always going to be a role for the triple helix. Yeah. You're, you're nodding, go ahead. Do you want yeah, to but I think um, today we are working in triple helix, but I, I know that our friends in Idaho already talk about multi helix, right? Before yes. it's a quadrum, quadro helix, and now yeah. multi helix. Yeah. Um, but in our situation here, uh, for example, in Bing Yung, we have a good uh, strategy to work between government and enterprise. And we build up uh, the industry ecosystem like today we have, you already see. Uh, and now if we would like to move in something higher technology, higher uh, 
um, quality, going to the deep quality like a knowledge economy, where the knowledge is the most important. That is the reason why we try to move up to triple helix. But in the future, of course, we can think about uh, multi helix. Uh, but right now, uh, we shouldn't uh, dream too quick. Three is enough. Yeah, firstly, three is three, enough. But I remind you again that for our Bingham province, triple helix is not only three, the base of all is citizens, always the people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Um, Gentlemen, we're out of time. It's it's great to see you all. I we I actually wish you were here. It's it's terrific. Uh, uh, we're really having a great discussions, a great time, and uh, we're meeting all of our new, old friends and new friends. So maybe we'll get you here sometime. I'm going to give you all four of you though a chance to to wish Bindong good luck tonight with the naming of the top seven. Moez, do you want to go first? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for hosting us. We truly appreciate it. I wish I was there with you in person. I wish you all the luck and not that you need luck because you have been doing the work and that is the most important part. So thank you. He's president of the jury. He's president of the jury. So yeah, very important man. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Eric Legal is an important man as well. Eric, would you like to uh, wish your colleagues here good luck? Yeah, just good luck. And uh, I'm, I'm really disappointed not to be able to be with you uh, in place because, uh, in fact, even if you can't see that, but 25% uh, uh, of my blood is Vietnamese. So um, I, I'm re very lucky to, um, to be with you today. Very good. You would, you would be very comfortable here. Um, there are so many similarities in terms of the intelligent community approach. Um, thanks, Eric. Chris. Uh, how about you? You've been in this seat before, Smart 21. You are actually a Smart 21. So maybe you guys can wish each other good luck. Yes, no, thank you very much. And uh, Ben Dong, thank, thank you for the hosting uh, tonight. And we uh, definitely wish you all the best. I think linking those, um, the, the enterprise, the government, and the universities to help your community is, is a very strong uh, way to go. So well done. Congratulations to get here is, is um, phenomenal, but then to go to the next level is even better. So all the best tonight. We wish you, we wish you great luck. Thank you, Chris. Uh, finally, Martin, uh, telling Estonia, an intelligent community of the year. You don't uh, have to be well nervous. said it all, but uh, uh, I also think that uh, Bindang uh, does not need any luck. The, the, the work is done and uh, they truly deserve it. So go get it. Very good. Gentlemen, thanks again for making the time. Uh, I, I know you have busy schedules and the times are, are always a little bit off, but uh, it's great to see you all. And thank you for sharing your views. Yeah, thank you. And Dr. Long, thank yeah. you as always yeah, thank you. for in, having us In any us case, here. we are all winners already. You are certainly all winners. That's a good way to end thank it. You. And thank you everybody.